Yeah. You ready, you ready guys? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Right. So, good evening, everyone, and welcome again to uh, the uh, usual weekly webinar that we run in the college. As always, we ask that you uh, keep your microphones on mute. Uh, also, turn your cameras off, unless, of course, you're, you're happy to show us some embarrassing pictures uh, during the talk. And um, uh, we would use the chat function to uh, send in questions, queries uh, during the discussion. Um, our president, Professor Ron O'Connell, unfortunately can uh, join us tonight, but we are uh, going to be hosted by our vice president, uh, Professor Laura Fiani. Uh, and Laura will say a few words now in a second. So we have a very interesting talk tonight. Uh, the title of it is uh, a, a very interesting. The chaos of the current environment is an opportunity for radical change. And it's a trauma orthopedics perspective. Um, and it's led by um, uh, Keith Sinnott, who is known to all of us, I'd imagine. Um, and he will uh, run the session with our guest speakers, who will be introduced uh, by our vice president in a second. So it's, uh, it's there's no doubt the topic is uh, uh, very important right now. We have the unprecedented times uh, hitting our health services and certainly doing the, the things that we used to always do, which arguably never gave us the results that we were looking for anyway. Uh, is certainly not the way to go. And is it time now to make some radical changes? And it'd be interesting to see the discussion that happens uh, here on that. Uh, and, you know, I, I certainly, you know, the innovation that happens in trauma orthopedics is, uh, is fantastic. And I'm sure there's some fantastic ideas coming out there. Uh, I was tying with the thing, what, what would you call a gathering of more than two orthopedic surgeons? I'm sure there's a term for it somewhere, but um, uh, we can work on that later. So and for now, I'm just going to hand over uh, to Professor Viani, our Vice President, just to open the session. Thanks. Yeah. Good evening and welcome. Good evening and welcome. Um, I hope you all are well. Um, it's a great pleasure to open this evening's webinar, um, which has a, a good, very good title, Chaos of the Current Environment is an Opportunity for Radical Change, a form and orthopedic perspective on what we could and should do. And Mr. Keith Sinnott, the national lead for the trauma service, will lead a panel discussion on the opportunities for radical change in the areas of trauma and orthopedics in the Irish Health Service. The panel will discuss how the chaos in the current environment gives us the opportunity to radically rethink how we could and should deliver our trauma and orthopedic service. So as I said, Keith will lead the panel and will lead a, an inter he would like an interactive discussion. So if you put up your questions on the chat, part of the um, webinar and um, Keith will you know answer some of the questions in 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 in, in amongst the speakers the panel includes um, his colleagues Mr Barry Barry O'Neill consultant trauma surgeon from Sligo University Hospital Mr Gary O'Toole consultant orthopedic surgeon from St Vincent's University Hospital and for Professor James Harty professor of orthopedic surgery University College Court so with that I will now pass you on to um, Keith Sinnott, who will lead and discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, I, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm, I'm sure someone will say something if you can't. Really? Um, so really, as, as we're all aware, this is really where we're at at the moment, that the, the shit has kind of hit the fan and these kind of semi-catastrophic circumstances which we read about in history books are kind of upon us and we're, we're living amongst them to a large degree and we've all been at lots of meetings and heard lots of we webinars talking about the difficulty that we face at the moment and the effect that COVID has on every kind of aspect of our care, trauma care, elective care, cancer care and everything else. Um, but I suppose it is reasonable and perhaps it's an excessively optimistic way to look at this and say, well, these circumstances are an opportunity for change. Lots of stuff that doesn't happen in normal times can happen in, in, in kind of crisis times. People are willing to make decisions quickly where they weren't in the past. And we've all had the multiple meetings and things round and round in circles trying to get anywhere. And to a large degree, this has kind of stopped. Um, I know in the matter, people have spoken about plans to build various different things here, there and everywhere. And with the kind of re relaxation and the emergency nature of the planning regulations, there's stuff that can happen. Um, we've all been told to try and dip into the winter initiative funding, which is kind of like Santa Claus with an enormous pot of cash to see what can happen at that. So there's, there's lots of things happening and it is an opportunity, I think, for us to look at changes, some of which can be very radical and some of which can kind of move what we do. So. 
what I'd hope to do today was to kind of lead a discussion um, insofar as we can in this kind of strange format to talk about what may or may not be happened, to try and canvas a few people for ideas that they might have had. And these are people who I know have radical ideas. I had a very strange um, experience of asking James Harty, would he mind giving the rest of us the benefit of his opinion? And anybody who knows James would know that that was a, an invitation he couldn't possibly refuse. Um, Gary and Barry, who, while, while they sound like a boy, a boy band, um, I think really what they are is representatives of different kind of orthopedics in different sides of the country and we'll get different perspectives. So I very much look forward to hearing what people have to say. I think we should try and be interactive as we can. The chat function is there. So if people want to ask questions on the chat, we can hopefully um, get some discussion amongst the panel and amongst other people. It might be a small little bit difficult to moderate that, but we'll do, what, we'll do the best that we can. And move on to the next slide. So kind of when, when you put into Google change manage, management or when you talk to management consultants, like I find myself doing with my kind of trauma job at the moment, you get slides like this um, talking about how to introduce change and how it comes about. And certainly the kind of dissonance phase and chaos phase, I think, resonates very much with all of us. It certainly resonates with me at the moment. I feel very dissonant as I am. Um, can we go on to the next slide? So it's kind of funny when I when I put into the search engine order out of chaos, this came up and, and maybe it's a it's an indication to me, but I had no idea that this was the motto of the Freemasons. And uh, it was the first time I understood why people are saying that COVID might be a conspiracy from governments. I struggled to know who could possibly gain from all of this chaos, but apparently this is what it's all about. And um, they're trying to have chaos so they can pose Orwellian order on us. Um, I'm glad I discovered that because I didn't know why, why, how my brain was being washed beforehand. Um, I don't really think this is what it is. And hopefully this chaos is something that we can use to put some order on things. So kind of to kick the ball rolling, I, I just kind of thought I'd present one simple little idea that I had, which might help trauma and orthopedics and how we might do this. So if you could move on to the next slide for me. Um, again, as we all know, during COVID, a huge number of healthcare workers have been affected um, by the virus, which has meant loads of staff shortages. So not only do we kind of not have enough enough beds and enough theatres and enough ICU beds, we don't have enough staff to man the ones that we have. And in the middle of the, of the, of the crisis in the matter, the radiographers were particularly badly hit, which I suppose is unsurprising as they're kind of going around the hospital all the time and they're typically trying to treat some of the sickest patients and stuff. So at one stage we got to the point where we might not be able to kind of take extras or we struggled. And I know there was a, a social media, I don't know if sensation is the right word, about some some situation in Cork where a doctor was asked to do an x-ray to avoid infection control very early on. And what it gives an idea of, of, of how kind of on the brink we were in terms of radiographers specifically during the crisis. We go on to the next slide. I mean, people may or, may or may not be aware of this kind of piece of legislation, which became law in Ireland in, in early 2018. And it's an EU directive uh, about who can operate X-ray machines. And certainly in the orthopedic department, it's very, it's very hard for us to avoid the temptation to push buttons on machines no matter where they are. So when we see a C-arm with a nice little shiny button, usually they're red, which is even more tempting. It's kind of hard to keep your fingers away from it. And we often get trouble for doing it. But actually this new legislation allows doctors to use x-ray machines. And as I say, it's been there for almost two years now. And if, if this was enacted, it would free radiographers up. They'd be available to do the CT scans and the people with the bad chests, uh, run MRI scanners and do, do things which I suspect are a little bit more commensurate with their skills then, than what's often waiting for us to get around to getting them to take an x-ray during theatre. Um, so I think that if we could get doctors to do this, it would reduce the amount of time that's, that's kind of wasted for radiographers who are a scarce resource at the best of times and more so during COVID. Go on to the next slide. And um, one, one of the things that the legislation says is that you have to have done a course to be able to do this, which is not all that surprising. You need some training in operating the machine. You need to know how to minimize radiation doses, how to measure doses, et cetera. Um, and this is gonna kind of be one of the barriers. But again, during COVID, the Povertaft Hand Center in Oswald Street decided that they'd make their ionizing radiation course available online for free. Um, so I kind of thought that I'd do it for the crack to see what it was like. And it was very interesting. It gave lots of information. And again, from a UK perspective, that's what I needed to do to enable me to use the x-ray machine. So COVID, again, gives the opportunity to run these things online 
to give us the ability to operate an x-ray machine, which we all know as orthopedic surgeons will make our life a little bit easier as time goes by. Can you go on to the next slide? And when you think about this, not only is it a, is it a case that it might, might make life easier in theatre, but it expands other opportunities. Um, this is a mini CR, which is designed to give very low doses of radiation. Sometimes they can even sit on a desktop and they're ideal for taking x-rays of things like fingers and wrists and hands. And if a doctor could, or, could operate one of these and you could place it in a, either a local injuries department or an ED or better still a fracture clinic, you can have patients coming in, sitting down, getting their x-ray, getting their splint, going home without the need to come in and wait in the fracture clinic, then go and wait in the x-ray department, then come back to the fracture, fracture clinic. So it would have the effect of reducing footfall, allowing us to time appointments. And some people might be surprised with big clinics that we don't have time appointments. And hopefully, ultimately, you know, lead to a, a better outcome for patients, reduce the risk for cross-infection, and, you know, use this opportunity that this thing has given us. So that's just one small little example that came to my mind, and I'm sure that uh, James and Gary and Barry will have other ideas about things that can happen and how we can utilize this, this kind of situation as we go forward. Next slide. Um, again, this is a typical orthopedic way of looking at things, and this is kind of the situation that we're in. Often we find ourselves trying to plan for perfection, whereas in the current situation, sometimes you don't need to aim for perfection. Good enough is good enough. And that sometimes, I think, is an opportunity for us to bring about some of these changes that hopefully we'll speak about over the next kind of three quarters of an hour or so. So that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Keith, thanks a million for that. Um, you know, again, that's the sort of thought provoking um, uh, information we need. I, I see um, Paddy Kenny has uh, asked that we get that legislation sent out. And actually what we might do is we might get that reference off you uh, and we can make it available to people and uh, therefore they can have a look at that and see how it's progressed. Such a, a, a such a, you know, a simple but very effective idea to actually uh, keep things moving along. Um, so Keith, you know, th this is your session to a certain extent. You want to get good discussion on this and uh, maybe you'd like to introduce the, the guests and uh, and and, uh, and we can start bringing in some questions then as uh, we get uh, each guest give their give their uh, perspective on things. Yeah, perfect. So the first person who's kindly agreed to talk is uh, Gary O'Toole, who, well, I suppose we have a small community, so none of us really need introductions to anybody, but certainly Gary doesn't need any at all. Um, he's all over every kind of media at the moment, I think, aren't you, Gary? Sorry, getting really the this is probably the smallest audience you've had in the last few weeks. <laughs> Thanks. Can everyone so, hear me? So, yeah. yeah. So okay. you're crack on, Gary. Cheers. Um, I did make slides, so if the first slide can go up, that's fine. But uh, Keith came to me, um, as he usually does, with plenty of notice um, um, many, many weeks ago and told me that uh, this was coming up. and. Uh, my brief was to be brief and also uh, to talk about things. So if you can go on to the next slide, I wanted to break this up into uh, local effects and uh, national effects of uh, the, uh, the the pandemic. Um, just uh, uh, the next slide, please. On the uh, local effect of, uh, of everything, and just to give you an example of what's going on in Vincent's, all of our trauma was transplanted uh, to St. Vincent's private hospital as the private hospitals were taken over. And that included our ancillary staff and our uh, equipment. Uh, the, the transport of patients was initially uh, considered to be a challenge, but that was very easily managed uh, by our uh, portering uh, uh, staff. And uh, we moved all theatre over overnight, actually. We had one theatre in the private hospital that we had access to all day, every day, uh, no matter what the pressure was from elsewhere and any other surgical specialty. Uh, and we had flexible hours, which made a huge difference uh, to our management of the trauma. In other, in other words, we weren't being hit at 3.30 every single day, being told that we can't send for the last case. So it was a remarkable amount of uh, cooperation by everybody. And we'd often send for the last patient, uh, and uh, this will give James a heart attack, but uh, often after seven o'clock at night, James, we were sending for patients on our, on our trauma list. But we managed to get through all our trauma on a day-to-day -day basis with very few rollovers. 
Um, and we had uh, numerous uh, obstacles to overcome at the time because all our ancillary staff that were in the private were also uh, consumed. Since, since moving back then to the university hospital, the staff that we relied upon that were there in the private hospital to help with turnover, cleaning theatres, etc., were di have been diluted. Um, and the ICU demands that we keep initially two theatres available for a COVID pandemic uh, second spike meant that we only had seven theatres to work with rather than our, our nine. Um, now our COVID testing is our major downfall. We used to get away with only having a COVID uh, questionnaire uh, and if they ticked all the right boxes on the COVID questionnaire they were fine. But now it's, we, they have to have a negative COVID test so you come in with your fractured ankle, you need a negative COVID test before you have uh, um, a free pass to go to theatre. Our major problem now is that our COVID testing uh, runs in the laboratory are done at 9 a.m. and again at 2 p.m. So you can immediately see the problem that if someone comes in at 3 p.m. in the afternoon uh, and uh, needs a COVID test, they can't get the COVID test till 9 a.m. the following morning which means that uh, they can't come to theatre before 1 p.m. when the results start coming back. So we have now found that we have downtime in our trauma theatres where there's nobody ready and nobody with a, uh, with a negative COVID swab. Three hours last Friday, three hours on Monday, lost uh, waiting for uh, swab results. And this is going to be the new norm. I think the solution to that then is quite obvious to me is that you run two uh, COVID uh, tests one at 9 a.m., one at 9 p.m. So you catch the majority of patients that might be first or second on the list the next next day. But uh, unfortunately, we are uh, a slave to our uh, microbiology uh, masters at the moment, and they will not run a second uh, load of tests after 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And the fast tests are, are now uh, not available to us in, uh, in Vincent's. Our outpatient clinic on a local setting uh, was absorbed by the emergency department as, as they needed extra facilities. Our outpatients was moved from where we normally are adjacent to the emergency department up until up into the first floor, uh, away from the uh, radiology department. So our patients had to come up, check in on the first floor, go down to the ground floor, get their x-rays, come back up to the first floor. So there was an awful lot of uh, internal transport uh, problems for, for us during the COVID. Um, ironically, our facilities in the temporary facility were better from my point of view in, in so far as that there was many more private rooms for consultations rather than those of you who might know Vincent's. They're just a curtain uh, around five bays uh, so uh, everybody can hear everything that's going on. So from a cancer point of view and breaking bad news point of view, it was much more private uh, than, than it was down, downstairs. So it was, in my opinion, a, a, an opportunity for the emergency department to expand their footprint within the hospital, but to the detriment of the orthopaedic department. Uh, we still haven't got 50% uh, of our outpatients clinic back, although we've moved downstairs. There's no uh, facility to stay socially distanced within the uh, outpatient facility. And there's no private rooms anymore for private consultations with patients who are coming to see us with uh, potential cancer or life-threatening uh, life threatening problems. Uh, we have not seen any elective patients, uh, the majority of us, since the start of this COVID problem. Uh, and um, I'm getting so bored in my orthopedic outpatients clinic now that I've started to trickle some of them back in. In a, in, a, in a manner so that you might have one or two in the outpatients clinic at the same time. So if you go to the next slide too, next slide. On a national level, uh, I'm responsible for the uh, um, appendicular sarcoma service along with my colleague, Mr. Alan Malloy, and Vincent's are responsible and they're, they're the hub of the hub and spoke model that uh, the sarcoma, appendicular sarcoma service is, uh, is, is built on. Uh, it has to be said that during the COVID pandemic, I moved all my uh, tumour service out of St. Vincent's University Hospital into Kappa National Orthopaedic Hospital and kind of flying without a, a safety net because a lot of these are large vascular tumours. That uh, It's nice to have a vascular surgeon in theatre down the corridor from you. But we got away with it and we did very, very well. 
I personally had 23 consecutive lists with tumor patients on them in Kappa Hospital. Uh, Mr. Malloy had uh, 16 uh, consecutive lists uh, with uh, tumor patients. And Mr. Malloy, you have to understand, also does tumor work out, out in Crumlin, which didn't seem to be affected as much by the COVID pandemic. And there was no decrease in referral numbers throughout the pandemic. And only one patient that was um, in, in inverted commas mismanaged as a result of the COVID crisis in an outside institution. All the elective surgery for us stopped, as everyone knows, in Kappa Hospital. And the hospital then accommodated outside institutions from their trauma, from Beaumont, Blanchardstown, St. James's, and indeed reached across to our plastic surgery colleagues in St. James's Hospital as well. And that ran, ran very well. To me, uh, this uh, highlighted the absolute unparalleled flexibility that exists within Kappa Hospital to deal with this uh, uh, pandemic and uh, to adapt and to allow people to come into the hospital that previously didn't have access to the hospital. And that raises my next big uh, flag that I want to raise here today is that they, they shone uh, during the pandemic and they proved that they can accommodate more workload. And that's what I think Kappa Hospital should be used for going forward. I've moved my tumour work back into St. Vincent's, but I cannot possibly see for the life of me why Kappa can't be extended as an elective facility to uh, centres that want to use it on an elective basis. I'm talking about my colleagues in Tally University Hospital, Navan Hospital, Drada Hospital that might, be, uh, might want to come in and do some work down in Kappa Hospital on an ad hoc or on a, a official basis, because I think Kappa has the capacity to do that. So to summarize then, next slide, I think that from a point of view from how the COVID has afforded us an opportunity in, uh, in St. Vincent's, I think that we need to get our outpatients back. We need to uh, try and get COVID testing back in for our trauma patients or else we will be swamped with trauma and we no longer will be able to do hot trauma. All trauma then will go 24 hours to 36 hours after the trauma has occurred. I think that Kappa has uh, shown the way that it can with its staff uh, who are so willing to work that to expand even more uh, uh, during uh, the, our, our challenges that lie ahead. So there's some just brief uh, things that uh, uh, I, I thought about um, over the uh, time that Keith gave me to give this talk. And I hope that it, it stimulates some sort of discussion. And uh, I'd be very interested uh, on anyone else's feedback on some of those ideas. Thanks very much, Gary. I think I think your point is exceptionally well made about the about having a protected hospital. Um, and there's lots of talk about elective hospitals with a lot of specialties, and I can only imagine those specialties look at us uh, jealously. We were able to move our trauma to Kappa when we needed it. If there was an elective hospital for for general surgery, they could move cancer there if it was needed. I know there's a lot of skin cancer work done in Kappa again because the plastics were there. Um, and, and, and we all know the problems that schedule care, that of schedule care interrupting into unscheduled care. And again, it seems like a no-brainer. The COVID crisis has shown us the value of it. It's shown us the flexibility that having a protected hospital gives you. And uh, it, it, I would recommend all specialties to look at it and try and find their own version of Kappa. Um, I don't think we'd be doing any work if we were relying on the, the, the hospitals where you had the influx of unscheduled care all the time. Mm. Keith, Laura here. Laura here. Just saying, I mean, have you any other facility um, like Kappa that you can use for orthopedics? Because it obviously, you know, for many specialties, it's the way to go. Yeah, so in, in orthopedics, the South Infirmary in Cork did something very similar to Kappa. So it is also a, a, an elective facility and it did exactly the same. I'm sure James will talk, talk about that. Um, Croom in, in Limerick is another elective facility which did some uh, trauma work during the crisis. Croom is, was kind of in a situation where it was being developed from an infrastructural basis at the time, so it was slightly different. Uh, Kilcreen in, in Kilkenny um, wasn't used like this because it's a bit too distant, I think, from the, the base hospital, but in Kilkenny they used the private hospitals, which is what happened in lots of other places. So private facilities were used, as Gary said, the Vincent's private, which is obviously on the same campus, but Whitfield and Waterford is off the campus. They did something similar in Galway. So 
there's, there, there was lots of flexibility shown and again being able to access facilities that were protected from unscheduled care and specifically protected from COVID and again I think it's a good lesson that hospitals can keep COVID out so they can keep doing non-COVID work. So what I might do is ask Barry from Sligo to give us some thoughts that he might have. Um, obviously, it's a slightly different perspective. Um, and I like the fact that, like, well, no, I was going to say I have got a shirt on, but I've also got shorts on. So I like this format where you can present like this. And I like that Barry is just skewing even the, even the, uh, the shirt. Good to go, Barry. Barry seems to yeah, frozen. Seems he's frozen, yeah. There he is. Uh, yeah. Can you hear anything? Yes, Barry, we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me now. Sorry, sorry. No, Keith, the reason I'm in this gear is I actually just ran in the door. So, Keith, Barry, unfortunately, we, we can't hear you. Your um, your connection is probably um, not doing too well up there. Run quite my sorry um here my connection went as well yeah are we back on we okay. are back on. yeah Am I on? if you actually if you turn off the video sometimes it gives you more bandwidth to uh broadcast what you want to say okay is that any better seems to be now yeah yeah i i was just saying in response to Keith's comment about the the list overran quite significantly. Um, I just want to go back to the point that Keith was making about radiographers and about orthopedic surgeons using the mini C arm. Um, my predecessor here in Sligo was trying to establish that himself for the last, according to him anyway, by the they didn't want to give up that responsibility to us. Um, and so, sorry, Barry, it's sorry, maybe yeah. if you log off and come back in again, it might be, it might work. Yeah. I wonder, so I wonder, what, I, wonder yeah. I see James is there. I wonder what might, might James, you skip ahead of Barry while Barry's trying to address his uh, connection issues. We've all seen this on RTE where they say bad line there. We'll come back to Tommy now in a minute as they say. So yeah, I'm moving on to a new, a new guest. It'd be a good idea. Great. Okay. Yeah. So, um, hi everybody. So James Harty is my name. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons uh, down in Cork. Um, has somebody got my slides there? Okay. Cool. So, um, I, I, as as per Gary, uh, Keith rang me on Friday night last week and said, uh, "What are you doing next Wednesday?" And uh, I got I got a few days to look at this. Big, given that uh, I, uh, maybe a day or two more than Gary, but not much in a busy working week. So what I tried to put together was a scenario for people as to what the situation is down here in Cork, a couple of things that we did during COVID and a couple of things that we would propose would be good things to do on the basis of the, the ability to change as quickly as, as people have been doing lately. Um, sorry, one sec, there's a, there's a trolley going past me here. Um, so can you go to the next slide? So just so people know orthopedic trauma has been pretty busy and it looks like in the next couple of years it's going to get even busier so however quickly we adapted during covid we're probably going to have to keep up the same level of adaption because it's going to increase by between 45 and 100 percent in the next couple of years between age uh, between bed day usage etc so we've got to become innovative in how we do things next slide 
Um, you can see in Cork, the trauma admissions during the COVID, they've kind of gone down a little bit, but we're slowly kind of creeping back up to where things uh, were, to where things were as normal. So you can see in our 2020 line, we dipped for a couple of months during COVID like everybody else, but we're kind of back to where we were now, even though COVID and all the various bits and pieces are still going on. So nothing much has changed for us, and we're as busy now in Cork. In Cork. In, uh, 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 Next slide. Next slide. Uh, and you can see the number of operations we performed dipped for a period of time. quickly. We're back to where we are now. And that's with all the restrictions that are going on around the place, with people supposed to be trying to socially distance, to be avoiding doing sporting events. The number of cases have gone right back to where they are. Uh, next slide. And again, our theatre activity. Our same problems are happening now as they happened before COVID. We're still only getting a certain number of cases that walk into us that are being completed. We're, we're still in court cancelling a substantial number of cases on a regular basis. Okay, go on, next slide. So one of the things that we did during COVID was we moved our operating lists to the Sutton Infirmary. So we kept doing cases in CUH who were the, the elderly and, fra and frail cases. Uh, but we moved all of our ambulatory ca trauma cases to the Sutton Infirmary. So the, the CUH column is on the left, and they're the cases that we did over the whole year. And that small column on the right is the column for the cases we did in the Sutton Infirmary. And we just did what we called ambulatory trauma cases, which were hips and our, which were ankles, wrists, patients who could have a block, who didn't need to spend a night in theatre. And we transferred those all out of CUH, and we did them in the Sutton Infirmary. And you can see that even in the middle of the COVID, we were still getting substantial number of cancellations for these patients but for the ambulatory trauma patients that we moved out our cancellation rate was down to about five percent and that was really only due to a little you know the, the volume of cases on a particular day but by being innovative and moving our ambulatory trauma cases out to a dedicated ambulatory trauma theater we were able to get our cancellation rate down for those cases to, to less than five percent uh, and we were able to reduce the number of cancellations we had in coh and we're running currently at about 35% cancellation rate. And in high summer uh, at the moment, because all our services have moved back to CUH again, we're now up to about 55% cancellation rate for our trauma cases in CUH. So by being innovative, we can get all of these ambulatory cases out into a regular theater, which is dedicated for these patients with a dedicated anesthetic team, dedicated ambulatory trauma team, and get these cases done. They'll reduce down the number of bed days that you'd use in a hospital. Um, next slide. We reckon that we're, 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 we've got about 1,900 uh, bed days that are being lost in CUH every, every year because of cancellations. So just using this simple model, we'll get a substantial number of those gone. Uh, even if you look at our hip, hip fractures, again, they've not changed. The numbers have been pretty much as they were all the way along. And again, go on to the next slide. Uh, and despite everything, with all these problems with hip fractures, we're still only hitting about 50% of our tariffs for hip fractures down in Cork. So if we were able to get all of these ambulatory cases out to a, to a, to a trauma theatre, a lot of these hip fracture cases that actually have a problem with theatre access would now get done within the Blue Book period. So just by being innovative in one area, you have a knock-on effect in multiple areas. Next slide. You can see that in Cork with the, with the with hip fractures, we actually cancel about 46% of our hip fractures, which do not get done within the 48-hour period. Um, and the national average for that's about 16%. So again, very clear argument for us to go and do an ambulatory trauma theater somewhere else that'll free up this space that get these cases done elsewhere. Next slide. Uh, this is again showing how once they get into hospital, they actually get really well treated. But again, the problem is that the, the bottleneck is at the gateway of, of theater, not having enough theater access and getting in to do them. So you, we hit the blue box standards for everything which is Stand four, five, six, and seven, but one, two, and three, we don't even come close. Next slide. Can you go to the next slide, please? And again, if we get them into hospital, we actually manage to get them out of hospital faster than most units. So we can get them out of hospital a day or two more than everybody else in Cork because we have a very good orthogeriatrician working with us. And again, that's something that if, if the hospital can increase the number of ancillary staff because you're saving those bed days, you should be able to get extra staff in to get those other patients moved through quicker. Can you go to the next slide? So the solution for the trauma service in Cork is that we would suggest that every trauma case around the country should now go to an ambulatory trauma theatre. 
all patients should be done under a block anesthesia and they shouldn't be they shouldn't have a post-operative admission unless there is a, a a need for it specifically and if they have a nurse-led follow-up the patients can be telephoned that evening they can be followed up and then they can be reviewed back in the orthopedic fracture clinic so you're, you're, you're reducing the number of patients who are in the hospital. Uh, you're reducing the number of cases that are having an, out, uh, an overnight stay. Uh, sorry, there's a printer going off here. <laughs> Can you go to the next, next slide? So here's something else we did during, uh, during uh, COVID. So we started to, in, 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 to initiate uh, the virtual trauma clinic out in Cork, in which we had been trying to get brought in for years. Uh, and finally, once COVID came, common sense applied and the virtual trauma clinic came in. So we were able to bring our patients through on a, a red, green uh, and orange pathway and, and brought them, bring them through a, a, a virtual triage clinic. And I'm gonna show you the results of having done that in Cork. Can you go to the next slide? So we have this list of, of cases that we can use. If they're green, they don't even need to be seen again. Um, they just simply go through the a &E and then they're sent away home. The orange ones get a consultant review and the red ones automatically come to the fracture clinic. Next slide. We have a pathway whereby we use a physio-led clinic. We have an occupational therapist. Uh, we have a team who now work in the fracture clinic. And there's three people who come to the fracture clinic every morning. You spend about 45 minutes with them in the clinic every morning. We go through all the x-rays and we, 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 we dedicate which of these patients go through which pathway. Next slide. Um, so you can see that our referrals, once we started this virtual tra tra trauma clinic, um, which really ramped up during COVID, you can see that our virtual trauma clinic numbers went up to close to a thousand. Um, and we were able to start to do this very quickly. It happened very fast once COVID came. We'd been banging our heads against management for months. Uh, next slide. And you can see that the, the clinic attendance for 2020 in the yellow started to come down in exactly the same time as the, the virtual trauma clinic numbers started to go up. So again, by being innovative, without much change, very little cost, we were able to make a significant difference to the number of patients coming through into our COVID clinics, into our clinics, and therefore reducing all this inter interface with COVID. Next slide again. So again, this is just showing the actual numbers. Um, Next slide again. Again, you can see that in the number of cases that we had, we discharged actually 60% of cases from the virtual trauma clinic in Cork now since we started the virtual trauma clinic in March. So up to 60% of cases are now not being seen uh, having been referred through a &E. Next slide again. This is just a, a pattern of where these patients go. Um, the vast, you know, a certain percentage of them come to the clinic. Some of them go to a physio clinic. Some of them go to a nurse-led clinic. Some of them are referred to OTs. And then we have a certain percentage of inappropriate referrals. Next slide again. So if you, if you innovate with this clinic, you can actually make significant cost savings. So we've been able to work out our cost savings in our clinic here in Cork. And we estimate in the six months that we've been running the virtual trauma clinic that we've actually had a cost saving of about 800,000 for the service. And that's only in six months. And that's that's on ancillary costs like clerical staff, like paper costs, like fracture clinic costs, uh, like classroom costs. And um, so by being innovative, we substantially saved the hospital money. And if if you can save that kind of money for one thing, you can divert it into other parts of your service. Next slide. So if you go and look at our elective service, again, in Cork, we have the same problem as everybody else. Orthopedics is nationally a, a massive, uh, it's the worst outpatient waiting list in the country. And um, again, go to the next slide. And again, if you if, if you come to Cork, Cork uh, in the South Infirmary where we have our elective work, again, the same thing happened. Now, one of the things that happened for us in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the COVID is we were like everybody else, they shut down our elective work. But actually what happened for us is that some of the private hospitals in Cork opened up and I actually ended up doing about 10 or 12 elective lists in the South Infirmary. I got about uh, 50 cases off my elective list starting in about April, end of April, once the lockdown started to ease. And I was able to get about 50 cases done in private hospitals uh, rather than in the public hospital because that's where my ambulatory trauma was going. So by being flexible and be able to move public work to uh, to private institutions, and I went there uh, 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 doing public work, which I wasn't doing NTPF work for, I was very quickly able to do a number of cases, get my waiting list down. Next slide. 
And as you can see, the waiting lists around the country are huge. Uh, you can, uh, any of the peripheral uh, cities, Cork, Waterford, Croom and Galway, which are the cities which aren't filthy like with the COVID, like Dublin, uh, you can do this work. <laughs> so next slide. So the solution, as far as I'm concerned, is to try and increase your theatre capacity wherever they may be. Uh, you know, if you can take a theatre in a private sector, a private hospital, which isn't which isn't uh, which isn't busy, you can move across and do it. And um, certainly, you need to increase the number of surgeons. You have to do it. And at the moment, we're trying to get a number of cases done. And I think that trying to get moving cases towards day case joint replacement around the country would be a substantial benefit for this, because again, if you're getting patients down to day case joint replacement, you're reducing their interactions with COVID patients. You're reducing the overnight stay. You're reducing the overall burden on the system. Although not everybody is suitable for this. Next slide. So Gary, having in, issued the invitation to me for COVID, to, to come to CAPA, now that it's orthopedic for, to do some operating, I'd be quite happy to take up on that now, Gary. And you could have a couple of Cork fellas up there doing it for you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, James. I mean, that makes the, that makes the point of, of getting the message across of those two things, the virtual clinics, which we all could see the benefit of, and certainly COVID accelerated everything, including funding, um, and also the notion of scheduled trauma. That's what been one of the big, one of the things I've been keen to push in the trauma system is that planned trauma care, that it doesn't all need to come through the ED, so it doesn't need to sit on a trolley, and it doesn't need to wait for a slot in theatre like the old pre-Ronald Reagan air traffic control in the US. So, um, again, a good example of, of of the changes that can happen, how quickly they can happen. Um, hopefully, Barry's connection is back on. Uh, it looks brighter down there. You've even got sunshine in Sligo, Barry. How is that? Is that better? Yep, thank you. So. Yeah, sorry, I moved out of this room initially because the sun was glaring in behind me, but obviously the internet isn't as good near the room. Am I still coming through clear? It keeps coming up that somebody in the meeting is muting me. That's not the case, obviously. No, no you're good. OK, I I didn't prepare any slides for this. Um, just a few points that I would like to bring up based on what's been stated already. Going right back to start with Keith um, and the point about the, the radiographers and us taking over some of that role. I know that my predecessor here in Sligo, Andrew Macy, tried for years and years to implement that in Sligo, and it was always blocked. He went off and did all the relative courses, and all the relevant stuff. He thought he had managed to get funding for the, the equipment, but it was the radiographers themselves who blocked it because they felt that we were sort of impeding on their territory, if you like. Um, and that's kind of slowed us right down. But it's interesting, I wasn't aware of the new legislation that you're talking about, whereby we are legally allowed to do it. And I think, as Paddy Kenny said, it's very important that we get that out, because that is certainly something that we could utilise in Sligo. And there's a willingness, certainly from the orthopaedic surgeons here, to do it. We actually did pursue a similar initiative in that we, at the start of COVID, introduced a physiotherapist directly into the outpatient clinic whereby instead of us giving the patient a referral form, they go to the physio department, they're given an appointment for two, three days time, they come back, they see a physio, they were seen by a physio directly in our clinic straight away without having to leave the clinic and come back, thereby reducing the workloads, decreasing the footfall, keeping them out of the hospital as much as possible. And the two SPRs that we had here initially when we started this were Paddy McCabe and Eilish Fitzgerald, and they ran an audit of satisfaction with the patients, with the surgeons, and with the physiotherapists themselves. And overwhelmingly, roughly about 90% in each group, people were very, very happy with the service that was provided and the outcomes thereof. So it's something that's proved very, very successful here, and we're going to keep that on. Now, at the moment, it's been done on a somewhat ad hoc basis by the physiotherapist who comes along Voluntarily, the department's freed them up to come to the clinics, but we're looking to get someone put in permanent. They need to get the funding for that, and it certainly decreases the workload that's going through, the number of people that are coming through, and it's been very, very successful. Now, the work that Paddy and Eilish did has been published. It's not PubMed indexed or anything, but I can get the link if anyone wants to see it, just to show exactly what we did. But it's certainly a very good innovation. The next point is going back to 
what Gary said about having the all-day theatre in Vincent's. We don't have that facility here in Sligo. We have a private hospital here, but it's a very small hospital, and it was reviewed by our anaesthetic colleagues who felt that it was unfit for purpose in that the facilities there were not equivalent to what we have in Sligo University Hospital, and that it would lead to a two-tier system between patients being dealt with in Kingsbridge, as it is, and patients in SUH. So we don't have that facility. And in actual fact, what has happened is we've actually lost some of our capacity because there was a huge push from the other surgical specialities to use the orthopedic theatre suite, which is distinct from all of the other theatre suites in our hospital. So we've got the elective theatre and the trauma theatre, which is on a different floor, different level, different part of the hospital from general surgery, urology, ENT, um, and obs and gynae, which is what we have here. And because we had that individual area, the other specialities felt it was unfair that we therefore had much more operating time than they had, especially when we get back to uh, orthopedic operating, or sorry, elective operating. So in order to maintain the ring fencing of our clean theatre suite, we had to offer them an olive branch, which was that when our trauma list finishes in the morning, then some of the clean services such as ENT and the pain service and certain other surgical procedures not involving bowel or anything else like that, they use our trauma theatre in the afternoon. And it's actually led to problems because previously that theatre would have been open and assuming that staff were available, we could have continued the, the theatre list on. Now we can't because we've got another surgeon coming pushing to get in the door at half past one to start the elective list. And it's had an impact. Just yesterday, my trauma list had to finish at half past one because there was a urology list starting. There was two patients cancelled, rolled over to today, and then there was further trauma today. So I actually had to cancel some of my elective cases today to do the two trauma cases that had rolled over. So we are very much pushing here in Sligo to get all day trauma theatre five days a week. And we also want to have a trauma theatre Saturday morning and Sunday morning because even though we don't need it every day, there are many times that we do need it, especially at the weekend. And because of the restrictions put in place with PPE and everyone being tested and everything slowed down, we're increasingly finding that on our morning list, we're only getting two cases done. And if there's any more than that, we're struggling to get the work done. So up until now, we've managed to get an all day theatre list for trauma on a Friday which was kindly facilitated by our anaesthetic colleagues on the ground that it would prevent these cases rolling over into the weekend and affecting everyone's weekend. But other than that, we still only have the four half days, Monday to Thursday. So that's one of the things that we're pushing for. Um, initially, we were told there weren't enough anaesthetists. That problem seemed to have been resolved. Then we were told that we don't have enough nursing staff and that problem seemed to be resolved. Now we don't have enough anaesthetists again. So I'm not sure exactly where we are I think most of the issue comes down to funding, 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 as it is everywhere else. But that's certainly top of our agenda to get that sorted out. The other point that I wanted to raise, which James also touched on, was about the, the virtual clinics. Now, again, as far as I'm aware, and I'm open to be corrected on this, Sligo University Hospital is the only hospital at the moment who doesn't have a speciality nurse looking after the virtual clinics, the trauma assessment clinics, whatever you want to call them. We've been running that on very much an ad hoc basis since the start of COVID in that all of our elective clinics were initially done via telephone assessments and anything that we felt was suitable through the trauma clinic, we were also doing it that way. But again, that was done with the goodwill and the hard work of the registrars and the SPRs that we have here. And realistically, we need to get someone put in place to actually run that service. So there's continuity when the registrars and the SPRs move on, and also to free them up from what is essentially an admin role rather than a clinical role, because obviously there's no educational purpose in that for them. So again, it's coming down to funding. We need the funding to put in place somebody who can look after that clinic, who can organise it, who can follow up on all the patients throughout the day and ensure that there's nothing missed and the ball isn't dropped at any point. Other than that, I was looking at a couple of... Uh, I wouldn't say papers, but a couple of articles which were in injury have just been published. One of them actually came from Waterford, May Cleary and Rory McNichol, looking at trainees and the use of 
forums such as this for education rather than the traditional um, core curriculum where everyone meets up once a month. And I think the, the sort of conclusions that have come to is there's still very much a role for the traditional face-to-face -face teaching, the core curriculum where everyone meets up. There's also a social aspect to that. But this is an opportunity for us to expand the telecommunication side of things, the Zoom meetings, the Microsoft meetings, all of these things whereby it's a lot less inconvenient for the trainees because they can do it over this forum. It seems to work fairly well. The satisfaction rates are in high 80s, early 90 percent for anyone who seems to be involved. And I think that's certainly the way forward. It's something that we can expand upon. And rather than take away from the traditional core curriculum model, we can add to it. And if we were to develop our own electronic program, if you like, then I think it would be a good grounding that we could use to then sell it to the other colleges in the UK and further afield on this is how things ought to be done in this current uh, climate post COVID and also with the technological advances that we have. Um, there's also that's injury again. There's a paper from Chicago looking at satisfaction rates between um, clinicians and patients with the sort of virtual clinic, for whether it be via telephone or face to face meetings such as we're having here. And again, the satisfaction rates are very, very high. So this, I feel, is definitely an opportunity for us to embrace the technology that we now have to cut down on the number of people who are having to come into hospital to be seen on a face to face basis to allow people to have their consultation done in five, 10 minutes, if you like, from the comfort of their own home, as opposed to having to travel to the hospital, wait in the waiting room, travel home, maybe two or three hours gone out of their day. And there's certainly scope there for all of us to drive that, to implement it. And let's say the papers that we have here have shown that there is a huge amount of success in it. And patients and physicians generally seem to be very happy with the outcomes. So that's just a few things that I was considering after Keith called me and asked me if I'd be interested in speaking. Thanks very much, Barry, and thanks, Gary and James as well. I mean, I think if I was to summarise what everybody has said is that when when given the opportunity to innovate and to try and improve, streamline and make patient care more efficient, people have stepped up to the mark and done it in lots of different ways. Um, not only have patients benefited, they benefit during stressful times. And as James kind of alluded to, there's been money savings as well. Um, there's also been efficiency. James managed to get through patients during COVID with joint replacements. And I, I think that that's an important lesson. And I'd like people to think about that, that if, if we're given the opportunity to make a difference and somebody asked me yesterday about, you know, what facilitates change and what facilitates it. And I say we've all had the experience of having ideas, trying to implement change and being killed by the cycle of meetings after meetings after meetings. And all it takes is for us to see some progress and we can get to places and we can introduce lots of these things. The IT world has certainly changed. Another thing that I, I, I've seen is the rate of change of IT are, 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 seems to be quicker than the rate of um, people saying it's OK in the HSE and in various different institutions. And you need to kind of move with the times. Again, in the orthopedic world, I think most of us have seen the benefit of something like Silo, which is effectively WhatsApp, which has helped things. And uh, Barry made the made the point about teaching online and people being available to it. <clears throat> One of the things that matter we've been able to do, and actually we did it at quarter past five this evening, is have a spinal spine cancer MDT for around the country. Clinicians, surgeons, oncologists, anybody from around the country can dial and get an opinion. Again, all these things are positive. But with the ability and being allowed to innovate, people have kind of changed a little bit. I just see a couple of hands up. Um, Laura, you're you're the boss, so you get first dibs. Yeah, um, I was just wondering with regards to training, uh, Keith, how are you managing to train your young surgeons with this? Yeah, that, that's definitely been a challenge, more particularly in the elective side than the trauma side and and more particularly in kind of the hospitals that have been impacted to a greater degree by COVID. So I know our trainees in the matter really did very little operating during the height of it. And in fact, people will be horrified to hear this, but the orthopedic department looked after the medical assessment unit in the early hours of the morning in the matter. So if you see a spike in the mortality rate, you'll know exactly why that is. Um, but definitely the training experience was diminished. Thankfully in orthopedics in Ireland, our numbers tend to be tend to be high. So this 
diminution. I think most of our trainees will will still have enough numbers for their logbook. And I see Owen Sheehan is there as the director of training and the last council meet or the last trainers committee meeting. That seems to be the case. So Michael Gilmore, I see you have your hand up too. Sorry, is your to me, Keith? I see you, you've got a hand, an electronic hand up. Maybe it's a. I have, yes. I was interested in your uh, introduction of the mini C arm. How much protection do you need around that when you're having uh, taking x rays, say on your desk or in the clinic from radiation? It depends who you ask. Um, so the, the way it works is it amplifies the radiation to such a huge degree that the dose is very, very low. So in theory, you don't need any protection. In theory, you don't even need a lead apron. Now, the standards for radiation protection differ in different places. And in Ireland, the, the radiation protection role has been taken over by HICWA and they're very strict. So you probably would end up having to wear a lead apron. The next question is, do you need it in a lead lined room? The, the answer, if you go to less regulated places is probably no. The answer in Ireland is probably yes. But again, there's, there's, there's sufficient funds around now to, to allow these things to change. And then now with the kind of the, the, the pull aside kind of aprons that you have made of lead that are in lots of places, they're pretty easy to get hold of, but the doses are very low. And again, they're all monitored electronically. The machine will generate, and usually it'll interface with packs so it'll store the patient's dose after you've taken their x-rays. So it's all very well controlled. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Keith, you can hear me. Yeah. So I'm going to put a, a kind of a, a general question. I mean, what you hear from everybody, the theme I heard anyway, was that the more you have access to ring fenced, uh, uh, you know, theatres, beds, uh, you use elective uh, areas only, you can actually start making big inroads into dealing with uh, the waiting list. And we've seen numerous presentations from uh, our national leads, both in TNO and in, and in surgery, about the, the, the crisis that's coming. And I've kind of nicknamed this thing the third wave of COVID. Uh, whatever the second wave coming, and we might be in the middle of that right now, the third wave is every other disease and, and condition that is actually failing to get addressed uh, as we figure these things out. So why don't we, if, if there was a, a directive come from the HSE senior management to give every manager permission, say every hospital must, every hospital group must identify a elective only hospital. And if that means shifting and thinking about making radical changes to our emergency departments, for example, and uh, changing the whole flow of scheduled care and unscheduled care, um, is, is that something people would be up for? Like, I, th I think most people, want protected operating and we all well a lot of us have it in private hospitals where you can be much more efficient because you're able to predict what happens predictability allows efficiency um, and and you can you can plan definitely to use all the time that you have so it would seem to be a complete no-brainer to try and ring fence them now then you might say well, some capacity is lost to the unscheduled care but you know you, you you kind of only have one problem to deal with if you do that so I think it makes total sense. It's within the Sloucher Care kind of description about having large elective hospitals. Whether there'll be there'll be capital to invest in something of that size, I don't know. But actually, there's ways to do it. As as Gary was saying, places like Kappa, you can use them in a better to a better degree. As Laura was alluding to, there are other hospitals which are protected from unscheduled care. I know in Navan, they, the the general surgeons from the matter use it, and I've had a tremendous experience doing doing elective general surgical care there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Keith, uh, Paddy Kenny here. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, I don't know, is David Moore on the line, but, um, and I know this is a bit more long term, but uh, Crumlin Hospital will become available when the PEDS service moves to uh, the National General's Hospital. And we think that would be an ideal place for a elective surgery hospital. Yes, very, very, yeah. But it has to happen quickly, Paddy, or else it very quickly becomes unusable. That's what happens in these places. The, the, the rate at which something becomes derelict is remarkable. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, Keith, with regards to the trauma um, service, um, you did a very good uh, day in the RCSI a few months ago where you, where you presented sort of the trauma and what you thought could happen and not happen. Where is that at this stage, or you can you enlighten us at all on it? Well, 
we're still awaiting for the ministerial approval of the designation for the trauma centre and trauma units in Dublin. Yeah. yeah. Um, and hopefully that will happen soon. But I've been saying that for a long time, that hopefully it'll happen soon. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the multi-annual plan for all the components of the trauma system. And to be honest with you, while that's kind of the headline act, there's way more... Um, benefits from things like James described. I mean, James spoke about some of the bad days that could be saved. Things like yeah. wrist fractures. There's two and a half thousand wrist fractures fixed every year in the hospital in, in the mm -hmm. country with an average length of stay of two and a half days. And we all know they can be done as day cases. So things like the planned trauma care, things like injury units, again, with COVID, the desire to keep people out of the EDs where they can get cross infection is high. So promoting injury units, because an awful lot of the stuff that we see doesn't need to go to an ED and move, moving things off site. I know Gary spoke about their, their fracture clinic being moved away. In the matter, our fracture clinic moved to Smithfield. We moved off site completely and it worked very well. Fracture patients and elective orthopedic patients aren't really sick. So do they need to be coming to an elective hot or to a, a model four hospital that's dealing with things like COVID and kind of clogging up the spaces? That's another question that, that you know can be asked and that is that comes from all of this reorganizing things to keep those people away from their, from those places. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Kieran, I think we're probably at time, are we? Probably, yeah, we're just gone past seven. I think I've seen a number of uh, the questions and thanks for everybody raising their comments and their questions mm -hmm. during the, the uh, discussions. Uh, most of the comments I think have been captured in the, in the discussion or answered by yourself, Keith, uh, as a reply to them as they come in. So um, unless you want to uh, some random wrap up uh, uh, work or Laura, do you want to well, uh, summarize a few things there? I think I'd first say that I think, you know, the orthopedic group are very, they are a very organized group, I must say. You seem to work very well together. So congratulations to all of you. I think out of chaos can come change. And uh, Mark Taylor last week, um, a gentleman from Northern Ireland said, life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about dancing in the, or learning to dance in the rain. I think that's what you're doing. I think your the change about the radiography is very interesting. I think the elective hospital is very important. I think the presentation from, from Cork was excellent on your virtual clinics. So I think you're certainly are making a great effort to improve all for patients. And I think you're also taking into account your trainees. So, you know, congratulations to all of you. And um, I hope that many of us can follow in your footsteps. <laughs> so thank you very much for this evening. Thanks very much, Laura. And if I, if I could just add just, just my thanks to, to, to James, Barry and Gary, because uh, yeah. they didn't get a lot of notice. And um, mea culpa maxima for that. But I think they did a great job. Um, and again, thank, thanks a million for helping out. Absolutely, thank you. And um, I'd just like to add thanks to all the backroom staff, to Kieran and to Corrig, etc. And also to, to ask all of you out there this evening, if there's anything you'd like for us to present or talk about in the, in the future webinars, we'd very much like for you to make suggestions. So maybe over the next few weeks, if you can think of anything, we'd be delighted to consider anything for the new year. So good night and stay safe and stay well. And um, again, thank you all tonight's speakers. Good night. Good night, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.